Thank you for joining us on Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. Each week, we invite you to send in your questions, uh, uh, share things that you're, uh, you've been pondering and wondering about, uh, perhaps an origin of a place name. Uh, this week, with a fascinating question on, on a significant intersection and uh, buildings, uh, landmarks, things that once were, uh, again, place names, people, anything that you're curious about, please send them in and we'll do our very best to answer them. And, uh, uh, and uh, when we can, reaching out to those who can, uh, outside of myself, that can share the stories of this remarkable place that is the city of Mississauga. So during these days of COVID and uh, as we're, we're at home, uh, apart together, we can explore the story of this fascinating place, the fascinating city of, of Mississauga. So please send in your questions. We look forward to hearing from you and uh, uh, join us as we as we wander down memory lane and explore the, the, the story and the heritage of the city of Mississauga. Thank you. Our first question this week on Ask a Historian is from Larry, and he's asking about an old ad that he found about the Riviera Fruit Farm. And thank you, Larry. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a property I know well. Uh, back in my, my academic years, uh, uh, close to 20 years ago now, I worked on a, a project uh, uh, documenting uh, the, the orchards and the, the buildings on the historic Riviera Fruit Farm. Um, the Riviera Fruit and Turkey Farm, uh, as it was officially known, was located in what is now immediately north of Highway 403 on the east side of Mississauga Road. If you're looking to kind of orient yourself on the on the property, uh, along with the remnant orchards that survive, uh, it's also home to the Leslie Log House, uh, of course, uh, home today to the Streetsville Historical Society. The Log House was relocated there in 1994. Uh, it's also known locally, however, and you may know this name a little bit better as the Pynchon Farm, uh, P-I-N-C-H-I-N, the Pynchon Farm. Um, that's uh, kind of the local uh, reference to what was the Riviere Fruit and Turkey Farm. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, the, the property was first granted uh, to Thomas Silverthorne, a, a veteran of the War of 1812, um, in 1832, on May 9th of 1832. Uh, he was granted lots three, four, and five of the fifth range north of Dundas Street. Uh, this uh, a, a larger acreage that he was granted included what is uh, now or what was the Riviera Fruit Farm. Uh, after Silverthorne's passing only a couple years later in 1834, um, uh, the property was uh, sold by the executor of the estate, Emerson Taylor of Springfield to Alexander McGlashan. And we have a number of owners over uh, a period of time. I won't go through all of them. They included uh, uh, William Crozier in 1905 and Frank Steen in 1926, both with Streetsville area area connections um, and uh, it was from Frank Steen that uh, Victor or that's right that James Pynchon purchased the property in 1931 and after 30 years that property then went to his son Victor Pynchon. Um, uh, in 1969 the Pynchon family sold the property to Halton Oak Estates which was a subsidiary of the Cadillac Fairview Corporation um, and they in turn uh, transferred the property to the province in 1979 um, and uh, the province transferred to the city of Mississauga in 1992. So even though the property has gone through a number of owners outside of the Pynchon property, the Pynchons continued to uh, lease the 33 acre property throughout that time period and uh, only coming to a close in the farming period in the, in the early 2000s. Um, James Pynchon, uh, Victor Pynchon's father, uh, decided to meet the growing demand for produce in the area by converting his new farm in 1931 to apple orchards, and uh, they planted apples, uh, uh, apple trees in, in 1933. Um, what is fascinating when you look at the, the property itself were simply the, the large variety of apples that were grown on this property. Uh, they included sweet bow, uh, lemon orange, Rhode Island, uh, Rhode Island greenings, Gravenstein, russet, Macintosh, Red Delicious, Spice, snow apples, russets, uh, amongst many others. This was a, a really well-known uh, and, and popular apple orchard. They operated a pick-your-own uh, service as well as a roadside, roadside apple stand as well. Uh, the apple trees have a productive lifespan of between 71 and 84 years, so just doing your math, that they were the old orchard was planted in 1933. They really are at the end of their natural life uh, in, in, uh, in the present day. Um, in addition to the apple orchard, uh, the pensions also had 
add other things like strawberries and rhubarb and asparagus and, and the like as well. Um, and uh, but perhaps they're very, they're locally were very well known for raising turkeys. Um, this gave the the uh, the pensions two cash crops: the um, the, uh, the the fruit harvest, uh, the fruit and vegetable harvest, as well as uh, the turkeys um, as well. Uh, Vic Pinchin uh, was among 25 growers who founded and organized the Dixie Cold Storage Facility. Uh, and in 1946, the prime market for goods on the Pinchin farm was actually the Kitchener Market. Um, the name Riviere was associated with the property uh, in the mid-1930s um, by the suggestion of a young victor to his father, James, uh, as he was taking uh, learning French in public school at the time. Um, the property today is owned by the city of Mississauga, and again, just from a reference point of view, it's on the north side of the 403 and on the east side of Mississauga Road. You'll see the remnant 33-acre apple orchard there, um, uh, as well as being home to the Leslie Log House uh, on uh, Mississauga Road. So that's just a brief history of uh, of the the, uh, the Riviere Fruit and Turkey Farm or the Pynchon property um, and uh, where you find it on the landscape today. So, so thank you for that. And if you've come across any more kind of historic ads from yesteryear, uh, please pass them along. We'd uh, love to chat about um, what was on our landscape. Thank you. Our second question this week uh, for Ask a Historian is from Adil, and uh, fascinating question, Adil. Uh, what is the most significant intersection in Mississauga? And that's something I've I've not been asked before that I can recall, and it's uh, it's had me pondering for a little while on, on how best to uh, to answer it. And uh, good to have a puzzle once in a while, and, and thank you for that. Um, it's fascinating when you look at a landscape stripped away and you try to come up with a, a very simple answer to you know, the complex relationship between people and space, uh, people and geography. Uh, geography shapes people and people shape geography and that, that relationship never truly ends. Um, and again, I've never really thought of the terms of a significant intersection. For, for many, the logical answer, historically speaking, might well be the intersection of Dundas and here, Ontario. If you think of kind of a, a prominent core of a community, the businesses that sprang up around it, the, the stagecoach service historically that was centered there, uh, most likely, uh, I, I don't have stats, but perhaps the busiest intersection in, in, this, in the entire city, historically and up to the modern day, that, that uh, core of five and 10 as it, as it was known, or Dundas and Center Road, Dundas and here Ontario Street. Um, th that perhaps is the, the easier question, uh, if you will. Uh, you didn't ask me what my favorite intersection was, and yes, for some odd reason, uh, I have a favorite, and that would be Dundas Street West and Fifth Line West, but that's another story for another day. Um, but after ha some pondering on your question, um, to me as a historian, I'd have to say that the most significant intersection um, is that of the crossing between the Credit River and Dundas Street. Um, from this geographic point on our landscape, uh, the layers of history are exposed and, and they're very plainly interwoven. If you, if you stand on that bridge or if you, you, you cross that bridge uh, or you're down in the valley looking up at Dundas Street, uh, the natural processes, the, the river the, and the geographic landscape that have shaped human history for thousands of years, um, uh, they, they, they plainly spill out, if you will, to see it. And um, forgive me if it's a, it's a kind of a rambling answer a bit. Uh, uh, it, this this intersection connects with the built landscape, not only just you know visibly Arundel Village, St Peter's Church, uh, ruins of a dam and a hydro uh, hydroelectric dam, uh, the Credit River itself, um, uh, cultural landscapes, the crossing of the river from the uh, Dundas Street Bridge. I mean, uh, what an achievement that would have been in in the early 1800s when a bridge was first built across the, the Credit River uh, as a as a major crossing point. I mean. Uh, these things uh, kind of all spill out and, and play out on the landscape. Um, it talks to the settling villages, the, the, the challenges of landscape, of, of navigating an, an early landscape, of what the road system might have been like. Um, the, uh, you know, they connect these early significant routes, one natural and one man-made, um, uh, connect to transportation and communication and social evolution within the landscape. They, they really tell a myriad of stories, and I, maybe I'm not 
being a, uh, you know an, having an excellent clear answer on it but I, I just think there's so many things we could talk about with uh, the credit river and dundas street um just thinking of you know dundas as an early route of transportation of travel and the credit river for harvests and fishing and fresh water and water power and transportation itself and uh just you know these significant things of of the human landscape and the natural landscape uh layering upon each other and how indigenous peoples and early settlers uh, interacted with that landscape and lived upon that land and uh, uh, shaped it and it in turn shaped them. Um, the city of Mississauga is the only place uh, where Dundas Street, uh, also known historically as Governor's Road, uh, first surveyed in 1794, uh, crosses the Credit River, which is one of Ontario's largest watersheds. Uh, the route Dundas Street over the Credit River uh, reflects strongly how the nature of the survey, uh, government survey, the cadastral survey, uh, which underlies and defines so much of our physical space, um, it, it shows how kind of the the, the power of nature uh, on this this man-made uh, grid, uh, if you will, on the landscape. Um, you know, the Credit River doesn't bend to Dundas. It's Dundas that bends to the river. Um, uh, when you when you look at an aerial image, uh, take a look at how Dundas deviates southward from a straight line just across the river at its narrowest point, there, across the, the banks at the narrowest point, and then rejoins its straight line. The straight line is the cadastral survey, the grid system, uh, that dates back, again, hundreds of years on our landscape. Um, but it bend to the will of the river uh, and it still bends there uh, we travel on that point to, to this day where, where generations upon generations of people have traveled and think of that just in the the, the exploration of time it's, it's, it's quite a, a neat uh, element to you know look uh, stand, go to st. Peter's and stand on the uh, on the parking lot uh, high, on the high ground overlooking the valley and just you know ponder at the generations upon generations of people that have interacted with that landscape uh, I have a picture of a in 1914 of soldiers marching along Dundas Street at the crossing the Credit River right at the foot of St. Peter's you know the, the, these these places have been etched on the in the lives of people for countless generations um, and that bend is still with us that bend as Dundas crosses the Credit River is still on our landscape to this day um, the, the Credit River really played a significant role as did Dundas Street on the settlement patterns and the travel patterns and the communication patterns of people that lived uh, within this landscape um, and so it's just uh, you know again you, you look at the, the the term significant in a landscape and, and uh, there are many that could apply and, and people who live in other parts historically and even today might, might think of other intersections that have impacted their lives and they reference on a, a daily or a, a basis or, or connect to a special event that happened therein. Um, but perhaps from just for, from my perspective, from a historian, and uh, perhaps it is a bit of a romantic view, but I, I do look at uh, that inter intersection, if you will, that crossing, one man-made, one natural, uh, as being perhaps the most significant uh, uh, intersection on our landscape uh, that helped define generations of people who lived in this space. So thank you for a fascinating question, and uh, uh, look forward to hoping you, hopefully, hopefully you will ask some more, and uh, we pause and contemplate the, the story of this place called Mississauga. So thank you. Our next question on Ask a Historian comes from Simran, and uh, uh, he's uh, asking about Malton, and particularly how it became part of the city of Mississauga. And so, uh, Mississauga, as you as you probably know, is not a village that became a town that became a city. Mississauga is born through amalgamation of villages and towns that were once independent or quasi-independent that were joined together in a series of amalgamations to create this this place that we know today as the city of Mississauga. And, and Malton is one of those places. Places. Um, early non-Indigenous settlement uh, began in Malton uh, immediately following the new, new survey of, of Toronto Township in 1819. And so we can trace some of our earliest community settlers in that community to uh, individuals like the arrival of Samuel Moore in 1823 and the, the Tomlinson family and so many others, uh, the, the early histories. And there's books written on, on the early history of Malton. Um, the name Malton itself, uh, we refer to the old town site, uh, the, the, town, the original town site as Old 
old Malton, uh, did not come about until 1854-55 uh, with the, the town site survey by John Stoughton Dennis when the name Malton was registered uh, in association with the Grand Trunk Railway. The old, old Malton really is a railway town. Um, however, Malton remained an unincorporated village within the larger geographic uh, entity that was Toronto Township. Um, uh, Toronto Township, the forerunner to what is today the city of Mississauga. Um, and uh, Malton within this uh, uh, had a certain, it developed a certain level of autonomy, particularly uh, as of January 30th, 30th of 1913, when Malton was granted the status of police village. Um, so it was not yet incorporated, but it was given a little bit of uh, autonomy within Toronto Township. Uh, a year earlier, uh, in 1912, some residents uh, in Malton had uh, begun to agitate for greater control over their own area, their own taxes, and explored the idea of incorporating in their own right. Um, it never quite happened that way, but they did attain police village status in 1913. A police village, if you're curious. Um, uh, it was it can be created through bylaw, and in this case in the County of Peel, when the population or finances of an area precluded the incorporation of the village but were still sufficient enough to allow for their own uh, improvement works, if you will. Uh, the county bylaw defined its geographic and political boundaries of Malton, had basically put an X on a map of, of what was Malton, uh, provided for an elected body of trustees to allow for the collection of funds, essentially in a formal tax levy, uh, and a police of village could establish uh, fire police and safety re regulations, erect street lights, improve roads, and build sidewalks. Um, um, but otherwise, it remained part of the overall township itself. Uh, in 1950, uh, Toronto Township applied to the Ontario Municipal Board to annex part of Toronto Gore Township, which is immediately uh, to the the, uh, the east of, of Malton, into a new Malton area. And this was granted 4,000 acres were added from Toronto Gore to Toronto Township, enlarging the Malton area. Uh, and that was in 1952. It took formal effect. Um, January 1st, 1952 saw the creation of Ward 5 in Toronto Township, and Malton is still Ward 5 now in the city of Mississauga. Um, and this uh, connected or, or brought together both the old section and the new section of, of Malton uh, through that amalgamation process. In 1953, a, a year later, uh, Malton Village trustees, as, as they were established by the, uh, the uh, police village, through the police village uh, in 1913, formally requested uh, that Toronto Township take over responsibility for policing and emergency services as they were running a deficit at that point in time. Um, however, there was uh, always a little bit of a, an acrimonious relationship between uh, the Malton trustees and, uh, and Toronto Township, particularly as the years had evolved and, and Malton's tax base had grown significantly larger than some of the, the other areas of Toronto Township. Uh, in 1954, Malton applied to the province to incorporate as a village, extend its borders, and separate from Toronto Township. Uh-oh, they were walking down the road to a divorce at that point. Uh, it was a messy affair. You can read it in the newspapers. They, they were not getting along, to say the least, between Malton, uh, the unincorporated village of Malton, and Toronto Township. Um, it involved stall, stalled bills, uh, counterclaims by Toronto Township aimed to block Malton's incorporation and separation. Uh, the matter was referred back to the County of Peel for a decision to be made. The province kind of washed their hands on the messy affair at the time. Uh, but after several days of uh, uh, deliberation and discussion, uh, on April 14, 1954, Peel, uh, Peel County Council voted 12 to 3 to reject Malton's incorporation by law. Uh, Malton as a separate entity was not to be at that point in time anyways. Uh, Malton was back at the table, uh, if you will, in 1965 with the Ontario Municipal Board requesting incorporation as the town of Malton and separation from Toronto Township. So they're knocking on the door again, uh, wanting out. Uh, at the time, the province was looking to reorganize uh, 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 rural counties such as Peel. Uh, and as such, Malton's application for separation and town status was deferred by the province waiting for this review of, uh, of rural counties. Um, and Malton ultimately lost its bid for separation. Uh, the police village of Malton ceased uh, with formal amalgamation through provincial bylaw of Toronto Township into the incorporated town of Mississauga in 1968. Uh, as Malton was not incorporated, it could not oppose the uh, provincial decision to amalgamate into the town of, uh, of Mississauga and officially became part of the city of Mississauga in 1974. Uh, so Malton, uh, 
uh, a Ward 5 uh, in Mississauga, a very uh, proud and distinguished community with a remarkable history unto itself, uh, but at one point uh, sought a, a different path, um, and, and those roads uh, diverged and then converged again uh, through the amalgamation process, and uh, Malton now very much integral to the story of Mississauga and a very proud component of uh, our city of villages. And uh, again, uh, thank you for uh, the, the question, Simran, and uh, look forward to exploring more local history with you. Thank you. Our next question on Ask a Historian is from Dave. Thank you, Dave, for your question on the Government Inn and specifically relating to its, its location and the plaque that honors it being in a different location. And yes, indeed, you are right. The plaque that exists today that commemorates the Government Inn's, uh, the, the, the Government Inn itself is located on the wrong side of the river from where the, the inn itself was, was once located. Um, the inn, the, the, the actual location of the inn was close to where the Waterside Inn is today on the south side of Lakeshore Road on Stavebank Road. Specifically, the inn itself was located basically underneath uh, Stavebank Road to the rear of the old post office and in close proximity to the front entrance to the Waterside Inn. Um, the, uh, the inn, uh, again, south of Lakeshore Road, the plaque that commemorates it's on the north side of Lakeshore Road and on the opposite side of the river. Um, so a little bit odd in the way which which history plays a role in commemoration of, of things that have come before it and, and where they place things. The plaque itself was put in place in 1964 um, and that was one of the few public parks that were available in the time to create uh, to, to be able to accommodate a public plaque and, and so that's the reason why the, pl the plaque itself was located in a different uh, location than where the inn itself was actually located. Um, so the Government Inn was built in 1796. Um, the first non-Indigenous building to be built in Mississauga. Uh, it was one and a half stories in height, uh, 30 by 40 feet uh, uh, um, uh, timber construction with two large stone chimneys at each end gable. Um, and it was uh, the description of it uh, um, uh, indicates that it was about 100 feet from the river and about 200 feet from a Lake Ontario shoreline. And so you, it's, we, can, we can place it. And we actually have early survey maps and uh, we'll include one here uh, that uh, that. Uh, show you uh, the actual location of where the inn once stood. Um, the fascinating part is kind of the some of the personalities attached to the inn because this was a public building. Not only was it our earliest non-indigenous building, but it was a public building um, when it was first uh, first built. Uh, the first innkeeper in 1796, his name was William Allen, um, and uh, he originally came from Scotland and was given a lease on the inn, uh, the proprietorship of the inn uh, in 1796. Um, 1798, there was John Coon, uh, Benjamin Gilbert in 1801, John Kendrick in 1804, and then Major Thomas Ingersoll, a retired uh, uh, military officer from the United States, uh, was uh, given the, the job as innkeeper in 1805. Um, Ingersoll is is one of the fascinating ones. His son Charles went on to found the town of Ingersoll near, uh, uh, not too far from Woodstock, Ontario, um, and uh, uh, Charles named the town in honor of his father Thomas. But probably more famously is uh, Thomas himself, uh, the innkeeper uh, at the Government Inn in 1805. Um, he was married three times in his life, and he had children with each of his wives uh, over time, and so he had a number of children uh, and. A, a wide range of ages. Um, the uh, his eldest daughter from his first marriage is one of the probably the more famous Canadian heroines in history, and that is Laura Secord born Laura Ingersoll. By the time Thomas takes the job of innkeeper at the mouth of the Credit River in 1805, Laura is already married, uh, living in um, uh, in Niagara. Um, and a few years later, when war breaks out uh, in the War of 1812, she rises to fame for some of her heroic uh, efforts on behalf uh, of the British Crown. be interesting to be a fly on the wall because, of course, she aided the British Crown, but her father himself was a retired American military officer 
officer, but uh, uh, not that we're uh, questioning loyalties or anything like that. There's quite a quite a, a gap in time between Thomas's time at the inn and uh, um, uh, Laura's heroics some years later. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, 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 Laura Secord, uh, the daughter of Thomas Ingersoll, who was the innkeeper at the government inn, um, you always like to ponder, you know, would Laura have visited? Um, the first wedding to take place in historic Mississauga uh, was actually the first, uh, 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 took place on January 15th of 1806, uh, and it was Thomas Ingersoll's young daughter, Elizabeth, who married Reverend Daniel Pickett. Um, and uh, uh, one wonders if, if perhaps uh, Laura in 1806 visited her father and uh, her half-siblings at the mouth of the Credit River. Um, so what happened in the years uh, after uh, Ingersoll passed away in 1812, uh, possibly buried on the property somewhere, um, and his son Charles took over the position of the innkeeper. Uh, a few years later, it passed to George Cutter and then Wesley Watson, uh, who was uh, uh, referred to in the community as Irishman Wesley, so I, uh, Irish Wesley Watson. Um, and the last tenant of the inn was Wesley's son-in-law, uh, Moses Pauly. Uh, Moses Pauly accidentally drowned in the Credit River on August 10th of 1839. He was operating a ferry across uh, across the mouth of the, uh, the river from the inn to the other side, um, and uh, he uh, fell from the ferry and, uh, and uh, sadly was drowned. Uh, that was the end of the inn. So in 1839, the inn closes as a public structure. It uh, then is uh, uh, remains in the Pauly family as a private home for uh, the wit for uh, Moses Pauly's uh, widow Mary Jane um, she later remarried to Robert Lind um, and uh, the property was subdivided and lots sold off and, and, the, and the like um, in 1861 the inn itself was sold for its building material it was taken apart the wood was repurposed for building a, a barn on the Madigan farm which was located just a little short distance up Mississauga Road uh, uh, and it only stood for a couple of years until it was lost to a fire in 1863. So the inn is no longer. Uh, stood on the property between 1796 and 1861. Building materials repurposed and then burned in 1863. Um, so the plaque itself that you mentioned again, it was uh, it was unveiled on September twenty fourth of nineteen sixty four, and yes, indeed, it is in the wrong place in terms of where the inn was located. But the plaque does reference that the um, uh, it, it is not on the site of the inn itself. Um, and there's been some interest over time of of creating a site specific commemoration for the uh, the government inn. Um, but again, the the inn was located on uh, the south side of Lake Shore. Road uh, and on the east bank of the Credit River, just below the old post office building uh, near the Waterside Inn, uh, underneath the course of what is today State Bank Road South. So, uh, thank you, Dave, for the question. Uh, always fun to explore local history with you and some of the oddities when uh, you put a plaque up to, to something that is not located in that uh, in that position. Sometimes creates confusion in the local narrative, but uh, always good for conversation around local history. So. Thank you very much for the question and uh, look forward to, uh, to, to more explorations. So here we are with uh, Ask Historian and there, our last section this week is not necessarily a question like we normally have. This is uh, uh, as we begin to reopen and explore uh, our city of Mississauga uh, through its culture and heritage and uh, uh, beginning to engage the public again. Um, uh, the museums of Mississauga are, are opening up with a, a, a fascinating uh, digital program, online program. Uh, to kind of re-engage with, with the public after these long months of, of, of COVID. Uh, so joining me this week is Elizabeth Underhill, who is Supervisor of Museums and Education with the uh, Museums of Mississauga. And uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, a program that is uh, right around the corner, right on, right during, during this, uh, these time, this week, uh, uh, Blooms and Berries. And, uh, and uh, I'm fascinated to learn more and uh, the program, it's the ideas and how you're engaging with people. And uh, after this, we'll have the links to engage with the program, including immediately after this, uh, there will be uh, one of their uh, one of their programs will be available as well. So Elizabeth, uh, talk to us about Blooms and Berries. Hey, Matthew, thanks for having me back on. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and doing this little plug. Um, Blooms and Berries is in the works right now. It is the museum's first fully online event. So 
the museums are very well known for our annual Maple Magic Festival, um, which sadly this year had to be canceled due to COVID-19. So we spent some time trying to figure out how are we going to be able to provide content and programming and learning experiences and fun family activities to the public when we still have to physical distance and we can't actually have big events and festivals and gatherings in the city of Mississauga right now. So um, Blooms and Berries was an idea that we started dreaming up about a year ago to be an in-person event sort of to take the place of your traditional strawberry social that would happen around June and July yep. in many Ontario communities. Um, and we realized this, this can't happen. We can't do an in-person strawberry social with everybody touching stuff and eating and it's not gonna work. So we reimagined it and now it's 100% online programming. Um, and there, as you said, Matthew, we have um, something coming up just in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tonight, one of our events will be um, happening online um, at five o'clock and you can register for it through our event bright page. And all of our events are around ideas of um, Clarkson's heritage as the strawberry capital of Ontario, as it was declared back in 1900. And the related agricultural practices that happened throughout Mississauga in the past and also what's happening today with urban agriculture and environmental activism and ecological sustainable gardening practices and all those good things so and you're you're it's not uh, I, I, this sounds bad when I say not just the museums I don't mean it as a, as a negative but That's you're part you're reaching out to to other entities with their expertise as well um, uh, environment as well you, you just mentioned how, how what are some of the synergies that are taking place here yeah, so I think this event really made that kind of collaboration possible because it's all online rather than being in person and you, you come into the museum and you meet with interpreters and you do crafts and maybe you take a tour. Um, over the last few years, the museums have really been working hard to showcase other uh, creative people and other experts in Mississauga um, because they are part of our history and part of our culture. So we um, partnered actually with the team in environment at the city of Mississauga, and they're amazing to work with. Um, museums and, and culture at Mississauga have worked with them many times before, and they just brought a really cool, like contemporary perspective to this whole, this whole event. It's not just about what happened in the past, but what did we do in the past that we're still doing now? That it's these practices that we still need today to grow our food in Mississauga. So they've brought in some really cool um, different groups like EcoSource will be yeah. doing a workshop and they also have um, a beehive tour that they're gonna be doing on Friday night with urban beekeepers who have set up beehives on top of Civic Center um, that sounds really cool. I read about that one. That sounds really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, we have activities that people can do online. We have some crafts. We have um, different videos that you can follow to learn how to make traditional strawberry jam. Um, but museums are really repositories of information about the times that we're living in and the, the times that we came from. So we want to capture that and reflect what's happening in Mississauga today as well. I, I was going to say, and, and kudos, uh, again, the, the idea that uh, museums and heritage are not just about the past. Um, uh, you're also giving a voice to the city of today. And, and uh, uh, I, you know, I think that's a fascinating element of, of, of programming and uh, of connecting to a, to a modern population. Um, the, uh, I, I didn't ask you this question before, so you're, I'll, I'll catch you cold on this. Um, the people that can't, um, uh, for whatever reason, connect uh, immediately when the, when, when the material is being presented, um, will they be able to access it after the fact uh, as, a, as an ongoing resource, I guess, for lack of a better word? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, yes, we are doing, I think it's, 
for the whole Blooms and Berries event, we have seven different live um, programs that are happening online. Unfortunately, we, we won't be able to record those, yep. um, but we do have a web page um, that you can go and you can visit and we'll share the link. And it gives you all these different activities that you can do. It links you to local um, vendors, people who are using environmentally sustainable practices to grow their food and make their products. Um, and we also have a, a couple of videos that we have made um, that will be available online um, for as long as we can keep them up. And I'm sure we'll, we'll bring them out from time to time. It looks like they're gonna live on our Facebook page okay. for a while. So yeah, we, we have a video on the history of Clarkson as the strawberry capital of Ontario. So where, how that all happened. <laughs> so that's, that will be, that will be around for people to watch. And we also did a really great interview um, with the founder of Blooming Boulevards, Jeannie McWright, who is working today in Mississauga to transform people's boulevard grass into native pollinator gardens. Oh, very so, cool. Uh, yeah, so we've got a video of her doing a tour of her garden and explaining all the wonderful plants that you can incorporate at home to attract beneficial pollinators. Um, and she'll also be leading a workshop on Sunday on how to design your own pollinator garden. I was actually going to ask you about that because I, I, um, I don't have a green thumb. Uh, the, uh, um, but I hear a lot more conversation and interest in, in the concept of a pollinator garden. Um, and so seeing, I, I know uh, at our office at, at, at Heritage Mississauga, we've got one as well. And um, uh, I think more and more interest around what that means. And I, I, I mean, kids love butterflies and uh, bees are essential to, I'm a honey fan, so that, that they can't go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, uh, I think that there's more and more awareness of what that is and our role that we can individually play in that. Um, and, and so I'm fascinated to, to see that. What are some of the, um, uh, a couple of the other programs that they, they might engage in uh, um, as well? Yeah, so just coming up shortly, we'll have a webinar with a woman named Karen uh, Davidson Taylor. She's from Pollination Guelph and she also works at the Royal Botanical Gardens. And she's gonna be talking all about how to grow native milkweed plants to support monarch butterflies. Um, and one of the wonderful things about native plants is that they are adapted to our local climate and soil conditions. Um, so they're pretty low maintenance compared to the types that you might get from the garden store. Um, so Karen's going to show how you can grow milkweed and, and why it's important to support monarchs, as well as other kind of native plants that you can bring into your garden. And I don't think you need to have a green thumb to look after them. I mean, I just put black eyed Susans into my garden um, about a month ago and they had no flowers on them. I haven't really touched them in two weeks and they're blooming. So they're meant to just go and do their thing. Sounds like my kind of plants. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yes. I, I, we don't know the path forward obviously we're still all of us whether we were working in this industry or on the outside waiting for it to open uh, none of us really see the full path forward yet and, and that's to be understood um, what are some of the ways that uh, people can engage with the museums um, obviously this program being one but uh, um, you're still working your staff is there um, uh, just just curious from a, a looking forward perspective if uh, maybe highlights mm -hmm. of the things that are, are happening or hope to happen at the museums well um, for now we are on Facebook and we're on Twitter at Museums of Mississauga so we try to post updates and highlights from our collection and things like that on on those channels and then if everything stays uh, stay safe and is going in a good direction with the pandemic, we are looking forward to opening up some new exhibitions in September. So um, we're actually working with <laughs> Heritage Mississauga on, on that project. So we're really, really hoping we will be able to bring um, war flowers to Mississauga, um, which profiles 10 different Canadian soldiers from the First World War. 
And we are also having a look at um, local contributions to the war effort during the First World War with an exhibition called Our Boys, which comes from all the research and material that you developed. <laughs> with well, let's, let's not give away too much on that because we'll have we'll do another segment just on that when we get closer to. It. <laughs> so, okay. so, to, so to come, we'll do it. We'll, we'll uh, for anyone interested in more, we'll explore those on, uh, closer too. But uh, um, it, it's nice. I mean, for for those that are watching us here today, and uh, um, maybe take a look behind each uh, Elizabeth and myself, um, we find ourselves at our office, um, yes. which has not been common since March. Um, yes, I've got mine on the other side of the computer. Just here. in <laughs> case someone comes in, <laughs> but uh, we're closed. <laughs> we're, we're slowly starting that route to um, um, a return to regular functions. Um, it will, it, it may yet be a long road, but um, uh, the most important is that we, we stay well and uh, those that we engage with and everyone around us, we stay well and uh, um, uh, at some point uh, programming will resume whenever that is, we don't know, um, but we're very much committed to reaching out and connecting and, and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm struggling for my words a little, uh, reaching out and connecting <laughs> and, and being part of in, in the community and having the community find, uh, find avenues to explore their culture and their history and uh, engage uh, within the city of Mississauga. So um, I guess on that, uh, uh, I, I wish um, Blooms and Berries all the best. I think it's a fantastic idea and uh, hopefully uh, 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 more to come uh, from, from those engagement programs. And uh, for those watching, take part, see what it's like, give your comments, give your, your suggestions, your ideas. Um, this is a new world we're all living in from a programming perspective and uh, uh, kind of uncharted waters as a whole. And so kudos to the museum team uh, for uh, uh, jumping two feet in and, uh, and uh, uh, developing something new and something fascinating and uh, uh, wish it all the best success. So thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us. Awesome, thanks, Matthew.